on the show today, Kula Lisboa. So Kula is someone I've met in my travels in Portugal and get on well with. Nice guy, does some cool work. I think probably an like embodied musical facilitator, does team building, does various kinds of community events. He'll tell us about himself. So um, Kula, welcome. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How, how did you get interested in what you do now? Like, what was your journey? At, at a very young age, uh, like uh, at uh, 13, between 13 and 17, I got really interested about uh, what was happening with spirit. I was interested in things that we could not see. And, um, and so I started reading a lot of books, like very mystical books and all of that. Yeah, I, uh, I was finding some answers and it was helping me because I was going through also a very hard, difficult process of growing up and also with a difficult parent uh, around. So um, the books gave me some uh, curiosity about life. And uh, what I did was I read a lot of books and, and made some crazy experiments back in the day, you know, like out of body experiences and things like that. But uh, I, was I was looking for some sense and purpose for my life. So at the age of 18, I went off my parents' home and I started traveling, uh, um, hitchhiking around Europe. And I ended up in a, in a festival where I had a tremendous uh, breakthrough experience and where I, I realized that I wanted to follow rhythm and music, especially I, wa I was looking for an identity. So uh, being an African uh, born person raised in Europe, I was kind of in between worlds and I didn't feel really African, but I didn't feel really European. But somehow there was something impelling me to kind of go after my roots. And so I found the rhythm through the djembe, the djembe community. And uh, yeah, since that time, I was one of the founders of the of the Jembe community and the uh, Mandinga culture. Let's see what a jam jambe is for those who don't know. Jembe is an instrument. I have it here. <laughs> so it's a type of drum. Yeah, it's a type yeah, so those of drum. on YouTube can see it. So it's kind of what you might imagine when you think of a uh, kind of African style, kind of large yeah, drum. Yeah. You put between your knees. yeah, it's African yeah. style drum and. And um, at first, uh, I, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. So we were just uh, jamming around with these drums and, uh, and expecting some uh, inspiration to come. And then uh, um, for some reason, there was uh, this immigration phenomen phenomenon happening in Portugal and all over Europe that a lot of West African people started arriving and some of them were real uh, connoisseurs of, the, of their culture and were masters on their own land. And so uh, we had the opportunity to start studying and engaging with, with that language. But that was just the beginning because that was just a kind of putting me in the track, but was not uh, particularly giving me all the answers. I had to go and uh, make the way <laughs> to start finding other answers. and. Um, and it was later on, like uh, maybe 10, 15 years later, when I decided to go and look for a drum circle facilitation. And uh, because that's where I started, I started as a drummer that would drum instinctively, intuitively, with no rules. Mm. And, and then I went into specific culture, you know, West African, and I studied and I made a lot of shows, but it was not, it was not fulfilling my soul and that's when I decided to go and look for drum circle facilitation and I went to the States and studied with one of the biggest authorities in the area which was Arthur Hall and um, and drum circles changed my life completely you know it was like a very important uh, turn in my life because uh, from that on I realized that uh, I decided that I wanted to make a living out of facilitating drum circles, uh, not only for regular people, but especially for the corporate world. And that was when my company was uh, born. And uh, Okay, closing that. Okay, we're going to get to that for sure. Yeah. So let me clarify a couple of things, Kula. So yeah. you were born, you were raised and grew up in Portugal, but you were born somewhere in West Africa, is that right? Yeah, I was born in Cap Verde. 
Cape Verde. Okay, so it's uh, uh, Portuguese ex colony. Yeah. Ex colony. Yeah, Portuguese ex colony. Yeah, yeah. I've not I've not been there, but I've heard it's beautiful. It's and beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so when when you see people in Portugal who are sort of darker skin, it's one of the more common places they're from, right? Like Cape Verde is kind of like it's got that yeah, connection. Yeah, Cape Verde, Angola, Guinea Bissau. <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you grew up in Portugal, the mainland. Yeah, I grew up in Portugal. I came here with one year. Wow. Okay, yeah. one year old. All right. So Let's clarify think, that. I think the cultural piece here is significant, right? When we're talking about rhythm, where it's from, it different places to learn. It is. This is significant. Yeah. And and drum circles for some listeners may be real familiar. You know, I've certainly sat in some, when I lived in Ethiopia, it was so common, someone would pull out a drum and then somebody else would start banging on a tin can. And sometimes like three or four hours later, you know, people are joining in just organically, yes. studying rhythms. And then this would happen, if not every day, regularly. Yeah, it wasn't like the an event. Of the drum circle. Yeah. Right. Like, so I've sort of seen it organically in East Africa. I'm guessing there are equivalences in West and other places, South and, um, you know, obviously the sort of more like hippie, inverted commas, drum circles kind of become a thing. Yeah. And some viewers may know it, some listeners may know it, and some may not. Like, what is a drum circle? Let's just start right there. Yeah. So, um, so like you said, drum circle uh, is still uh, being seen as a very hippie thing because it was born out of the hippie culture. But that's the modern drum circle mm -hmm. like the modern drum circle but drum circle as a as a philosophy it's something that exists for thousands of years in, right, in humanity right. you know it's the act of gathering people around music making especially percussion instruments where the whole community would dance would sing everybody would take part and there wouldn't be this separation between musicians and, and, and non-musicians or dancers and non-dancers. So everybody was allowed and was uh, invited to be involved. So, but if you talk about the modern concept of drum circle, mm -hmm. um, I would say that one of the, the fathers of it was Babatunde Olatunji, which is a Nigerian musician which uh, migrated from Nigeria to the States back in the 50s, I think. 60s and he was the first one to say to the white people you should drum you should yeah. drum and find your rhythm culture you know and he was one of the guys that inspired my teacher which was Arthur Hall so when an African guy comes to the western world and realizes that uh, that there's this culture needs to retrieve their power of rhythm and he said it in a very humble way. And he was able to transmit that message. He said, go, people, go and look for drumming, you know. And, uh, and it inspired a lot of people back in the day. And one of them was Arthur Hull, which was uh, uh, like a hippie that would gather in, around California, you know, and, and join with multiple people from multiple uh, cultures and just drum like you said like in would could be nigeria could be anywhere in the world people would just join in the circle and drum and uh, right and yeah the, basically it's just sorry after you yeah I, I was gonna say basically that that's that's the the, the principle but then what happened was that uh they started to uh, be um there was the need of kind of leading these drum circles because what was happening, and this was something that uh, everybody relates to when they start drumming intuitively, was that at some point, every, the people got together, they didn't have any knowledge at all, you know, about what they were doing, but they would start a rhythm. And then suddenly that rhythm would engage with other people and suddenly there was a motion, yeah? You know, like a movement and it made sense. But suddenly at some point, somebody got really excited and started going bah, 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 and it would turn into chaos and it would fall apart, break down like a, yeah. a, a train wreck, you know. 
And that was when some people started realizing to avoid that train wreck, which was that dismantling of the rhythm abruptly and mm -hmm. not in a very nice way, they started to, uh, to look for ways and tricks how to keep the movement going, how to make people that don't have in their body any rhythm culture, how to make them drum for hours, you know? And that's when drum circle facilitation was starting to, to, be, uh, to be born. And, uh, and the, the, the guy I studied with was one of the first ones. He has many books written. Uh, Let's talk about this idea of rhythm culture then, and then we'll come back to say some of the benefits and things people get yeah. from being in drum yeah. circles. So, yeah, as you say, like in a lot of sort of North European kind of Western culture, there's like classical music, which doesn't really have any rhythm or not in the same way. And then I guess you've sort of, as well as the upper class tr classical tradition, you have folk traditions that have a lot more rhythm. Yeah. And I know you have my own cultural background in Ireland, for example, there's the, the Irish drum, which you play with a kind of stick between your fingers yes. and you know, you're going to yeah, hold it in one hand. Drum. Bow drum. Bow drum. Yeah. yeah. And you, you'll, you'll see people in pubs get them out and maybe multiple people. And there isn't this distinction of like the musicians on the stage and the audience you know, yes. in an Irish pub, there's musicians and maybe someone pulls out a tin whistle and sort of joins in or a fiddle. And it's, it's very organic in that way. And even more so when I was in Ethiopia, like yeah. the, 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 it's a communal participatory thing, even just, you know, beating on a table. Yeah. Uh, rather than the kind of audience consumer passive. Thing. Yeah. There's a, there's a big distinction, isn't there? I think within those kind of two types of things. Yeah, yeah, because the, the I think uh, when somebody, I'm just guessing, you know, uh, from things I read, when somebody like Baba Tunde Olatunji, this uh, man I talked about from Nigeria, says to Western people or to white people, you need to go out and retrieve your rhythm culture. Uh, what he was saying, it was not, oh, you should go and learn African rhythms. You know, what happened in the Western world, and you can see through history, is that um, a lot of these folk traditions uh, became separated from uh, the community events, and they started becoming more like performances. And so what they, what they did was that some people got really specialized or experts in doing rhythm, you know, like musicians and, and so on. But then all the rest of the crowd just watched passively. And with time, centuries of that, that made people lose connection to rhythm. And then if you talk about, if you talk more in a, in a more wider perspective of development, if we see we in the Western world, we created amazing things and we have everything, but all that we did in a way kind of separated us more and more from the rhythms of nature. You mm -hmm. know, we started living in big cities. You know, most of us live in big cities. We don't, you know, you see kids that don't know that the, 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 the cabbage comes from the earth. You know, they think it comes from right. the supermarkets, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Pineapples are in factories or something. Yeah. yeah, you know, things like that. And so that separation from nature made us in the Western world lose contact with our own natural rhythm, you know? And I think that's what this guy, Baba Tunde Olatunji was talking about. Because if you go to Africa, even now, or if you go to a lot of some parts of Asia, you know, this uh, way of living music is so in the blood, you know, people get together, you know, they're gonna make the crops everybody comes and sings when they're doing the crops, you know, or they're going to work and, and plow a land. They don't have uh, machines and they're going to plow it all by hand. But there's somebody putting a rhythm on or a song to motivate. So music is part of life, you know, so they use music mm. as, a, as this motivational tool. But uh, we, if we go to the fields, ah, we carry our own speakers and we have the music there. But in Africa, the people come and play. You know, this is the difference. So everybody naturally is more connected to their rhythms. You know, it doesn't mean that they are big. You know, I'm totally against this uh, perspective that says that, oh, you have uh, African blood, so you must be good with dancing and with rhythm. This is a 
total bollocks, you know, let me say the word bluntly, because it has nothing to do with that, you know, that's really not true. Anybody, the, regardless of their skin color or their backgrounds, has music in them. Mm. And it's not because you are black that you dance better or play better. That's uh, a myth, you know, and, uh, right. and it's very hard to live with that myth. I, for me, I confess it was not easy because everybody thought, oh, he's black and he's so good because I'm not. I struggled to, to study. I studied. Practice to learn well, right? I had to learn all of this, you know. Yeah. yeah. It was like not I, coming just like that. <laughs> a, a good example that I grew up, uh, I, I grew up in a place that wasn't a lot of music around. I wasn't a big dancer. And then I went to live in the slums of Brazil. And in Brazil, you'll see people who are very dark skinned and you'll see people who are whiter than me, you know, because yeah. their heritage could be from many places. It's a real mix yeah. in Brazil. Yeah. And in the favela, it's all mixed up. And most people are somewhere in the middle, but there's a real spectrum. It's not black and white. It's the whole spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brazil the thing is, is the biggest you... example of the world. Ever mix. But the thing is, people there are dancing from when they are babies. You know, like music and rhythm and dance is there. So by the time everybody's 80 years old, it doesn't matter what color they are. They've got great rhythm. So the idea that it's something genetic for me is just nonsense because I saw those kids and I didn't, you know, I saw that they could all dance better than me at eight years old. And I thought, yeah. oh, they just grew up with this. You know, it's not like in their yeah. genetics about. Okay, so I love this idea that kind of cutting off from music, cutting off from this... Um, even the word music almost feels like the wrong word because it feels like a performance, right? Like now I am listening yeah. to music, like performative percussion, community sounding, you know, there needs to be almost another word for it. Like cutting off from that, we lose something, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like um, um, this, this um, it's, it's not very easy to, to, to find a term nowadays to explain like uh, to explain what somebody like me does you know because like for example i struggle a lot of times with some people ask me uh, but uh, what do you do uh, or what is your profession and like immediately what could jump to my head is musician but i don't feel myself as a musician because because of this concept that i have from the word musician musician right. is somebody who studied, uh, you know, made There's all the efforts to become an expert yeah. in music, but just that. And that's not what I did. I, I had, I did many turns and twists in my life, you know, to realize that, that that's not what I do, you know. For me, music is a tool for something greater. And and so as a tool, it's something already in itself so big that I cannot uh, box it into just performing, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our society kind of managed the way to frame it in music performing, you know. And um, music is so much bigger than that, so much bigger. So that's why it's not easy uh, like for people like me and there's others in the world to really say or explain what I, what am I? I? I normally say I'm a music facilitator, um, mm -hmm. and uh, especially I work with rhythm because for me rhythm is in the foundation of everything. And rhythm, for me, goes beyond music because inside of music you have rhythm, and music rhythm is like huge. <laughs> it's like it can overgrow over music because rhythm is life. It's part of everything we understand. You know, rhythm is, is polarity in action. You know, you have a sound and then you have a silence and then you have a sound and then you have a silence, you know? And if you look at everything in life, if you look at nature, how light uh, um, diffuses across the universe, how, how uh, water, you know, how the tidal waves or how the rain comes, everything is about rhythm. You know, because it's there's a moment there's something happening, and there's a little moment there's something not happening. You know, right? So, right. And I was at a Chinese doctor today, and she was feeling my pulse. So you know, yeah. what's she feeling? She's feeling yeah. my rhythm, yeah. right? She's like, yeah. how well are you? And I, I yeah. see this longing in people to get back to it. You know, someone said to me today, because of COVID and being indoors a lot, they were like, "What year is it? What season is it?" 
or a lot of women in the embodiment world are getting interested in their female cycles. That's like a really big thing in the embodiment world. In what, you know, sorry? Their in female the, cycles, their, their female, uh, female cycles, cycle, their menstruation, yeah. their yeah. periods. Yeah. Like that's super big again now. Like I feel we're aware that even something as simple as electricity, you know, there wasn't yes. much electricity where I used to live in, in Ethiopia. And so night was a big deal compared to here. There was a few light bulbs in places where we were, but, you know, it was much more minimal. It wasn't street lighting, for example. Yeah. And um, it was it was a much bigger deal whether what season it was and whether it was day or night. And it feels like there's a longing to get back to those in a way. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, even when you talk about this, that you're saying, like, the, the, um, the, the woman cycle, like, the... the um, the women are really lucky in relation to us men because they have this phenomenon that happens in their body that is psychically happening and it, it, it relates to nature. So it's very bluntly in their body that there's a rhythm. There's something that happens every uh, days or every weeks, you know? So they are very lucky in that. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that I feel, because like one of the things that I've been observing um, throughout my years of experimenting and, and facilitating groups, uh, I don't know if you feel that, Mark, but I feel that like my, if I'm going to make a percentage of people who came like between male gender and, and female gender, I would say 70% women and 30% men. Yeah, oh, a group I was in last night. You know, night, because I women shocked, are yeah. no. more engaged with this phenomenon of the rhythm. And so they are out there and going out looking for answers. Why did they stop having this connection with their own rhythm? Because they feel it stronger than we. We just don't have this phenomenon yeah. in our bodies. Or we have yeah. it, but it's much more subtle. You know, it's not so visible. It's not so physical. We have it as well, of course. If we like, if we dive, if if we do like I did for many years, which is engaging in in this, looking at the cycles, feeling how the moon affects me, feeling how the how everything that's happening with the with the planets and everything that's happening with the earth, the seasons, the weather, everything affects me, you know. And if you go really deep into that, you start to see that there's a pattern, a pattern, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. there's a rhythm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, even just the rhythm in the day, you know, it's a very definite. I went to the gym in the evening yesterday. I normally go in the morning and I was like, oh, this is really different. Yeah. You know, like I'm having to adjust the weights and what I felt like doing and like strength and all these different, you know, very physical things. I was like, oh, this is an entirely different thing than going in the morning. Yeah. And like, like, like even that kind of realization, the times of year, you know, when it, in December in England, I don't want to work. If I've put my di if I've put stuff in my diary in December, I'm an idiot. I have to cancel it. I don't want to do a lot of work in December. I just want to hibernate, you know. Yeah. And yeah. But like that's something I'm a bit smarter about now. When I look at my diary, you know, I'm like, okay, let's midsummer, midwinter. Maybe let's not plan yeah. too much work in there, you know. Yeah, that's that's kind of you uh, following up what you feel that's happening in nature, you know, because if we live in this. Uh, time zone you know we have four seasons so when it gets to december we are reaching that point of like all of nature around us is going into the earth so we also as humans and as part of nature of course we want also to go back more, a bit more in but the thing what's happening with the craziness of the world the jobs and everybody that's not aware they are so overwhelmed with all these other things that they forget that they are not respecting respecting the nature's rhythms, you know, and that's when they start then like they will start feeling the problems, you know, health problems or psychological problems because they will start feeling that they they are not able to engage with something which has been always there since ever, you know, which is the rhythm of nature. You know, and we are part right. of nature, but we were able to create a culture that pulled us out of that rhythm. You <laughs> Pretended know? we're not. Pretending we're not until it kills us. And yeah. okay, so back to the drum circles. That so yeah. drum circles benefits. It connects people to this sense of natural rhythm. 
I've seen in them a kind of, you lose yourself in them sometimes. Like there's a sort of group flow. We had Stephen Kotler, who's a big flow guy on the podcast not long ago. And there seems to be a way which, like sometimes I'm like, oh, I can't, I remember, you know, Ethiopia, like, I can't do this. And then I'd find myself going along and they'd be like, you know, people be encouraging me, you got it. And before you know it, time's flown by. There's this great feeling of togetherness. Yeah. Say again. You get into a trance, you know. Yeah, trance. Yeah, trance yeah. state and, and connecting yeah. with the other people. Like, this is why you use them for team buildings, right, as well, is that there's a great connective sense to them. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the, 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 the magic things, it, you just mentioned it, one magic things about the drum circle is that, um, like, it, there's a phenomenon happening that uh, transcends us, you know. And so we kind of get into this uh, openness state, you know, of flowing. And what that does, it's kind of, for me personally, it dilutes the sense of, um, of me. It, mm. I dissolve. Yeah. The me dissolves into this larger being, which is the whole group playing. And when that happens, we suddenly are very humbled because then suddenly we have access to information that we thought we didn't have, you know? And uh, I think you, you can relate to that because when we are centered in ourselves, when we are doing activities that we are centered in ourselves, we are working as a unit. It's of course, it's strong, but if we realize that we, are we, if we have the opportunity to gather more units to that uh, state and suddenly we are not only one unit, but we are 100, 120. And then suddenly all these units dissolve and they become one single unit, but it's a huge being of, of knowledge, you know? And that's when I think one of the magic uh, things that happens is that we are able to access the collective memory of everything you know of the past of the present and of the future and that's why one of the things you see happening in drum circles is people sometimes going crazy and doing things and then suddenly it, and they do beautiful things and then if you ask them to do them again they don't know because it just right. came to them, you know. I've, yep, I it definitely just found happened, myself. You know, <laughs> I don't have much musical skill, but I found myself going to go along with things, and keep up with things, or even add things. And it's like, where's this coming from? Like, there's yeah, this exactly. one. Where is this coming from? <laughs> just giving your ego a break is fantastic, right? Like any group, yeah. people love sex and dancing and anything when they go into this sort of biggest you know higher self the groups the individual kind of dissolves a bit into the collective and then yeah. and then as you say there's a transcendence there's a emergence of creativity that seems to come yeah. through that yeah. and, and if and if you look uh back at what's happening now and what was happening for thousands of years um we are always kind of, uh, as humans, we are looking for this state, for this uh, um, um, feeling of being connected to something, being part of something, you know, something, uh, some people call it faith, some people call it religion, some people call it football, some people, whatever, spirituality. So we all are engaging to look, finding this something that makes us, gives us this uh, sense of belonging. And, um, and if you look at shamanic cultures uh, around the world, when I talk about shamanic cultures, I'm talking about the, the, the cultures that were able to, to survive despite of the, of the coming of the big uh, monotheist religions. And if you look what's arriving now, you know, breaking the show the, to let you know what uh, we actually example, do. So, the medicine and plant and plant wisdom wisdom that's who produces this podcast, me and my wife, and the rest of the game. We, um, we train coaches, we train people to be body coaches and being facilitators. Of something and people are already, you know, therapists, that's yoga teachers, dance teachers, meditation with teachers, with teachers with the, with the, coaches, and facilitators, all time to work more with the body. So, courses throughout the year, loads of free offerings. If you go to embodimentunlimited.com or the embodiment app, my iPhone, you will hear about. 
about the things we actually Drive. do throughout the year, the different Worst. free offerings. Do about one a month, something for free. Um, yeah, loads of stuff there. there free books. Uh, what else? Lots of videos, things. showing coaching, and all the different courses we offer. Really loads and loads of free resources. You don't have uh, really nice app, really easy to use. And the website's not bad. You can take a plan. Have a look. The embodiment app. But you don't need it. There's pros and cons. There's pros and cons to taking mushrooms or something else. That music could be a safer or easier way in. You know, like imagine if you turned up in one of your Lisbon corporations and said, okay, guys, today we're all taking magic mushrooms. There may be a, there may be an issue, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easier for me to put them, you know, I had situations like um, you making jokes about that, but I had situations, uh, stories with drum circles in companies that, uh, yes. you know, they come in all dressed up and thing and, and I get them all excited, banging on drums and that whatever happens you know and then at the end i had people coming to me wow is that normal that i saw tribes and and had visions and had things that have nothing to do with with this actual reality and i would say uh maybe uh enjoy it but i will not try to explain it to you you know because there's no point on it but people which were coming from completely distant worlds, you know, from this spirituality or shamanic world, they would engage in visions which are completely related to this world. And, and you go, what? I didn't give them anything to drink. I didn't give them anything to smoke. Mm-hmm. The only thing I gave them was a drum and I guided them to sing and express their happiness and their sadness, whatever. And suddenly they are there in that place, you know, and they have the memories of magical things happening. So, yeah, and this I is the power. I mean, I've, I've done a fair bit of corporate work. I've even seen, you know, I had a, a friend of mine, Chris Terra, who used to do some drum work in kind of business businesses, you know, locally, but I haven't done it in a while. And um, it's sometimes people would be a little stiff, a little resistant. You know, I saw good facility like Chris, another guy likely called Jamie, and they would just give them something small to tap on, you know, some kind of gentle way in. And pretty soon they'd open up, you know, I don't know how you find that, you know, a group's very resistant. What are some of your sort of secrets for kind of getting it going? Uh, you know, um, I had multiple, you know, I think I could have, I don't know, maybe I had uh, done drum circles for more than 50,000 people wow. in general companies, you know. So I had multiple experiences, but in I would say 99 Point nine percent of them uh, people are very easy you know but I can tell you that some drum circles uh, uh, takes me more energy than others right I'm a person that I when I go into that set I give everything so that means that if I want them to go crazy I have to go crazy myself. So I go right. crazy. But for me to go crazy, I have to put a lot of energy. You know, I have to do a lot of things to for me to go crazy. Um, but it, I would say that there is a few tricks that you can use to uh, break off people's resistance. And one of them, which was one of the most natural ways that I found, was always have a smile on. Right, right, and be like that That's sincere, my open basic person. trick. <laughs> if you love what you're doing and you are enjoying to do it, smile. And if you smile, yeah. everybody's like, you know, they are completely all their barriers. They drop out immediately. Right, you know? makes, because, makes and sense. And for me, and for me, when I'm smiling, I'm not forcing a smile. It's it's from the heart. I'm having pleasure. Like I'm talking now, right now. Great you. job. It's a great job. Why, why, not, know, why not be happy like doing that? that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you should be in an awful job. And you're teaching drumming and doing workshops with people. It's fun. Huh? <laughs> I have that same thing when I'm teaching. I'm just like happy to be teaching. I'm happy to be doing embodiment. You yeah. know, I was just in Quinta Tenchi, which I'm sure you know in Portugal. And I'm like, I'm just happy to be there. And there's yeah. a sincerity to that. Like if we love what we do, there's a sincerity that opens other people up. And I... I guess you're sort of explaining to them as well, though, right? You're saying like, hey, this is going to be great for your team cohesion, creativity. Like, do you kind of like do a talk on like why it's useful or do you just kind of like jump straight in there? 
some points, what I started doing with, with as I become became more mature with the process of facilitating, what I started doing is I, I I've always was uh, um, um, advocate of experience first, understand after, and in fact that was one of the things I learned from one of the biggest teachers I had, which was Wilbert Alex. He passed away two years ago. Um, he was my teacher for other modalities that I do. And uh, he would say, experience first, understand after. So I always went for that. But what I started doing, especially in the corporate world, because people like, uh, it's like we sell the drum circle as a team building activity. But yes. for me, team building is a very uh, general world. Yeah, what does it mean? What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. It means, you know, I, is it just fun? Fact, is it about communication? I, you, I hate the word. Yeah. I hate the word. Yeah. You know, yeah. but that's that's the easy. It's like it's like it's the same thing with with uh, meditation and mindfulness. Okay. If you go to a corporate company, if you go to a company and say, "Oh, we're gonna do mindfulness," oh yeah, wow, this is. But if you say it's meditation, well, what is that uh, okay you know? sounds like different so yeah. team building it's a very easy word to encompass so, but what i do is much more deeper than team building but that's the easier way to to sell it so what i started doing uh throughout the drum circle the experience i would i like i just did one two days ago uh, it was um, a, a group of German people from Siemens. Siemens. <laughs> yeah, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound and, very uh, rhythmic, does it? Yeah. You know, and for them, I, I know that in their heads, they think, oh, this is a team building. This is a fun activity. It's just that. But so I started breaking down uh, what is the real meaning of a team? Why is a team not working? And why is the team working? And you can see that bluntly, directly in a drum circle. If the people are open to follow somebody that's leading them with happiness and joy, okay, so let's explore that, you know. So um, I started explaining people what is it happening throughout the drum circle, you know. Why, why people get confused sometimes. Why why they go into chaos. It's good to feel the chaos. It's good to be completely lost in the rhythm and experience that side because in life it's going to be like that. And then to come back, why is it important that I drive you into chaos and then bring you back into harmony, you know? So I started explaining that and that started waking up in people the sense that the drum circle is much more than just the team building. Right, there's more there, there's more now. Yeah, it's, I, know, I know there's much more here, but we're almost out of time. Yeah, um, wh where do people find you if they want to kind of get in touch, give you a team building job or anything else? Where, where do they go? Yeah, so uh, uh, they can go to ritmundo.com, which is my main, uh, my main website. Uh, Could you spell that? Because I R, yep. R I T M U N. D O, oh, like world, world, yeah. It's Ritmundo. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a play game that I did on the word, because ritmo is the word for rhythm, uh, for rhythm in Portuguese. Yep. Ritmo, yeah. And then I enclose it to Ritmundo, uh, which means like rhythm for the world. But at the same time, if you say Ritmundo, Rit means laughing. Uh huh. Okay, so, so laughing it's, with the world. It's kind of saying two things. It's saying rhythm of the world, but it's saying laugh world, you know? So it, it, the two things combined, I think, describe perf perfectly what our company is about, you know? So we try to deliver, yeah, amazing experiences in the body, main, all totally in the body uh, for people to discover about themselves. And we use these potent tools, which are, music, dance, uh, breath, and, and things like this, you know. So the easiest way to, to find me is at ritmundo.com 
or in Instagram as Kula Lisboa or Facebook as Kula Lisboa. I'm pretty sure I'm following you there because I've seen some cool pictures of you at festivals and on the beaches, doing gatherings and yeah. some of the more counterculture stuff as well as the corporate stuff. So yeah, really nice, yeah. Really nice to see. Yeah. And uh, any kind of closing messages about the body, anything you want to leave our audience with? Um, yeah, I, I would... <laughs> So what I would uh, say is um, I can talk about my own experience in the sense that um, is I felt this pull or this curiosity since very young age to understand uh, the invisible world, you know. And with time, I started realizing that the only way to understand this invisible world is through the body. You know, so what I would advise everybody in the world is go and do as much as experiences as you can, you know, try everything. And if it's something that calls you, then dive deeper into it. But expose your body to experiences, because only then you will know what is there for you, what life, what life is being offered to you, you know. So I think something simple like that. <laughs> beautiful man I, the time has flown by i really enjoyed catching up yeah, with you again I, I, i'm sure i'll amazing. see you in portugal again bye <laughs> i was like how did that happen i gotta take a break I before the next talk, podcast talk for more two hours then uh we always have a nice flow so uh, you know i think yeah. me and you are going to become friends over the years so i'll, yeah, I'll yeah. see you I again you, and i tell you Thank and and i tell you just now this is a personal that it's been it's been quite a pleasure to get to know you more and more because uh, oh. you are a very uh, you are a very uh, curious person full of interesting layers and it's always fun to hang around <laughs> with you because you have you have what it calls a very uh, particular sense of humor and I had a teacher one time this same guy Wilbur Alex he was saying to me that. Um, Whenever you 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 are looking out for a teacher, or or somebody that's uh, a guide for you, somebody that's going to be a, a, a like a, a, a representative figure for you to follow or to learn, look first if this person has a good sense of humor and he makes good jokes. Because if he doesn't have a sense of humor, he doesn't laugh about himself you don't bother following but that's a warning sign isn't it so i'm not sure yeah. why it's a, a warning or a recommendation but let's leave it there thanks man yeah if you like that you probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app um so on both of these things you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here and some exclusive ones with some big names some people you'll probably recognize that are over there um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF of my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to be people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga. And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.